So now I'm welcoming Nathan Snyder. Um, he is, and I'm very grateful for that, he helped us uh, in uh, making a concept uh, for this workshop, working out the call for papers together with Eva Kovac, uh, and we made the call for papers. You responded to, to that, and you were invited to take part in this uh, workshop. Nathan Snyder is professor of sociology, sociology at the Academic College of Tel Aviv, Yafo. In 2000, 2016, he taught at the uh, Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, and uh, his research focuses on cultural memory in Europe, Israel, and Latin America. He also had a a uh, keynote address at one of our conferences, Simon Wiesenthal conferences in 2014, as far as I remember, uh, where he compared the memory politics of Argentina and Spain. And he was born a child of Polish, uh, and after the World War, after the Second World War, stayed the survivors of the Shoah, and later, as an adult, he moved to Israel. Selected publications, as you can see, uh, also from the CV uh, and the abstracts, but I want to add two recent publications. One is together with Doron Rabinovich, Herzl Reloaded, which was presented maybe a year ago, also at the Wien Museum, where we have been yesterday, and his latest publication is Memory and Forgetting in the Post-Holocaust Era. He's now going to uh, make his opening remarks, uh, and the title is The Jewish Judgment of Hannah Arendt. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Bella, for this kind introduction. Um, what I'm going to do now is uh, two things at the same time. I'm going to uh, try to frame uh, our uh, topics of the conference and at the same time also uh, giving kind of introductory lecture and giving in my own uh, two things two cents. I mean, yesterday we had an exciting philosophical opening for this workshop, and today I'm going to take a sociological turn uh, at about the same issues that we uh, listened to yesterday. So let me start with a couple of questions which were not only of interest for Arendt, but for all of us dealing with issues of genocide and mass death. And the questions are, <clears throat> Are Nazi murderers just a bunch of criminals? Can a legal system be the appropriate tool or its courts the venue for dealing with the traumas of past atrocities, the legacy of the Holocaust, or the unprecedented sufferings of millions of victims? What does that do to our faculty of judgment, which of course is not only the formal decision given by a court of law, but also our capacity to give an informed opinion and our capacity to cross the bridge from the particular to the universal and back. Thus, I think, is the overall theme of our workshop. What we will try to do is to reconstruct the intellectual origins of a human and social vision rooted in the belief that even in a secular age, we are blessed with the capacity to distinguish between right and wrong and good and evil through exercising our power of judgment. We may stress the sanctity of this world and speak of the autonomy of the individual as one of the fundamental principles of modern society. Clearly, not only Jewish intellectuals were concerned with moral individualism, which is both transcendental and of this world, but it had a special urgency for them. The particular world of devout Jewry was no longer sufficient to cope with the challenges of modernity. This was very much Arendt's concern but of course, not only hers. The main point here is that the universal and particular exist in a kind of dialectical relation. They do not oppose each other, they define and influence each other. This is a crucial point, I think, in Arendt's enterprise, and we will see this in the course of the next two days. The universal means what it does because the particulars are its background. And where the particulars mean what they do, because the universal is their background. As a result, when one changes, the other changes. But importantly, neither disappears. Universalism and particularism need to be thought out together, and this is exactly what she did. Hannah Arendt, like I said, the Jewish intellectual, is the main protagonist with whose help we will explore these questions over the course of the next two days. She expressed the sentiment in an early essay of 1945 and guilt, on guilt and responsibility, asking what universal responsibility actually means. 
The essay concludes with her comments about universal responsibility and its relation to the concept of humanity, which she sees as a part of the Jewish tradition. And I quote her, perhaps those Jews to whose forefathers we owe the conception of the idea of humanity knew something about that burden when each year they used to say, our father and king, we have sinned before you, taking not only the sins of their own community, but all human offenses upon themselves." End of quote. Now questions about the criminal nature of Nazism were debated immediately after the war and defeat in connection with the Nuremberg trials. Arendt and Jaspers, Karl Jaspers, who was her dissertation supervisor and a very close friend, defined the terms of this debate in, ex in an exchange of letters in 1946. Arendt, who later became notorious for her own published account of another Nazi trial, the one against Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem in 1961, did not really believe in the capacity of legal language to deal with crimes which can be called crimes against humanity. Such crimes, in her opinion, ruptured the limits of the law. She inquired whether we are really equipped to deal with a type of guilt that is beyond any crime, at the same time as she saw the Jewish victims as endowed with an innocence which goes beyond goodness. Karl Jaspers, of course, was well equipped to answer her. His book on the question of German guilt, published in 1946, remains not only a contemporary product of Germany's handling of the past, but has recently turned into a parad paradigmatic reference point for a political and philosophical analysis of guilt especially Jasper's well-known distinction between criminal, political, moral, and metaphysical guilt. Criminal guilt, as you know, refers to those acts for which one may held liable in a court of law. Political guilt refers to the responsibility one bears for the political system in which one lives by virtue of being a citizen. And Jasper's distinguishes between criminal and political guilt on the one hand, which are public and external, and moral and metaphysical guilt, which are private and internal. In the case of moral guilt, the individual must come to terms with the breakdown of his or her conscience after the fact. It refers to whatever personal failings one has exhibited where one's own conscience can, only where one's conscience can be the judge. This is a type of guilt that grew out of having decided to make one's conscience subservient to the state, a part of what it means to be judgmental. Metaphysical guilt is even further removed from the human realm. It's a cherishing of your guilt as a quasi-religious experience through which one can rise to greater spiritual heights. In metaphysical guilt, one is only answerable to God. Thus Jaspers answered Arendt, Arendt that he did not wish to bestow any form of, as he put it, satanic greatness on the Nazis. Rather, they should be treated for exactly what they were, criminals in all their banality and triviality. Thus, the concept of banality already appeared in this exchange in 1946, coming from a letter from Jaspers. Now, as you all know, and we will talk about this uh, pretty much over the next days, Arendt steered much controversy, especially in America, German, and Israeli circles, for her portrayal of Eichmann and her sharp criticisms of Europe's Jewish leadership. Arendt's politics, molded in the heat of 20th century Jewish political activism, left a deep imprint on her political theory. She clearly did not shy away from judging, just the opposite. Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil, became one of the most controversial book of, books of its time, and probably the one she's best known for today, especially in the Jewish world. It is probably, in my opinion, the most Jewish book she ever wrote. And what made this book so famous, of course, was not only the phrase banality of evil, which nurtured an interpretive literature of its own in regard to perpetrators of mass crimes. Arendt's interpretation gave rise to interpretations of the Holocaust as bureaucratic and mechanical, even though this was apparently not really her intention. But what made the book electrifyingly famous was the enormously heated debate that it set off among both Jews and non-Jews about how the Holocaust should be understood and how it should be talked about. And it is a report about a trial, which until this very day provides us with a language to think about the atrocities of the Holocaust. 
But Eichmann in Jerusalem was not only a book about the Holocaust, nor was it only a continuation of the origins of totalitarianism that dealt, among others, with the legacy of the Holocaust for human rights. It was a book about the moral evaluation of Nazi crimes as an example of the ever-present possibility of mass murder in modern times. And it was a book about Jewish responsibility and politics during the dark times. Finally, it was a book about Israel and the meaning of Israel for Jews. And that is why the book still steers so much controversy until this very day in Israel. Arendt was not willing to recognize the foundational moment the Eichmann trial had for the young state of Israel. And if she did recognize it, she was not willing to accept it. And this is a rather curious point, and it is, in my opinion, a rather astonishingly apolitical perception of the trial coming from somebody who, first of all, defined herself as a political theorist. Now, not written, of course, in such a vein, the book was read by many of its Jewish readers as an attack on a Jewish nation still in its infancy. And in many ways, it was. It was almost like a prophetic attack on the reasons of state and if you like, it recalls the prophet Amos with his iconic words, woe to those who are at ease in Zion. Aaron did not want the Jews to feel at ease in Zion, even 16 years after the Holocaust. For many, that was unforgivable, as unforgivable as her reproaches of some of the Jewish leadership, in which in her eyes collaborated with the Nazis. And she didn't want or was not able to take the perspective of the Jewish victims of the time, who themselves, of course, were not able to take a remote analytical position on the Holocaust. For them, the perpetrators were nothing but anti-Semitic monsters. Who else could they be? But I think that, the Arendt, that Arendt's New Yorker articles and the book that came out of them were the source of endless misunderstandings, both at the time and still today. For many, the banality of evil formula is a way of normalizing the crimes of the Holocaust. Anyone could have done them. Eichmann is no anti-Semite. Banality is thus the deepest insight, the final dismissal of charges. One of the consequences of the trial was, of course, the changing status of victimhood to its transformation from something to be ashamed of to a sign of grace and moral righteousness. But how can the concept of banality be handled legally? This is a big question. It is certainly true that if anyone has interpreted the banality of evil as meaning that Arendt thinks that Nazi crimes are trivial, they are profoundly wrong. That's not a deep point. That's a very clear point. But, and this makes it more difficult to handle, it is true that banality in the phrase banality of evil does mean every day. But it also means unbelievably, unbelievably trivial and boring. It also refers to thoughts that are so commonplace every day that they are not worth mentioning, meaning cliches. That's why it stands out. No one knows exactly now today what she actually meant with the banality of evil, but everybody remembers it today. One can even argue that it is the most remembered cliché of Arendt's work. And the reason for both of these things is that in its own way, the phrase is like poetry. And I mean that quite literally. It combines two words that it seems no one ever combined before, banality and evil, and flash. You get the sun, sudden tingle of something new. So talking about what the word normally means only gets you halfway there anyway, because this isn't a normal use, so it isn't a normal meaning. Now, what Arendt is mainly referring to with the phrase, I think, is the reasons and rationalizations of Eichmann. The reasons he did what he did, and the reasons that consciously committing one of the greatest mass murder in history didn't really bother him. She comes, she comes to two conclusions listening to him. And they both stun her precisely because of the enormous distance between the tininess of this man's concerns and the enormousness of the crimes. That is at least how she perceived it. It didn't seem possible that the greatest criminal in history could be a stupid little man, a nebbish if you want, that you couldn't even wreck a satisfying revenge on. She was clearly on some level expecting and hoping for a devil, for the villain like you get in an action film, someone enormously, obviously, dramatically evil, 
that you could get some satisfaction out of blowing to hell, one who would explain it all simply by their presence. An enormously evil person does an enormously evil thing for enormously evil reasons, which perhaps he rationalizes with enormously evil rationalizations. But with Eichmann, with Eichmann, what really struck her, Arendt, were his magic phrases. I think this was the referent that was foremost in her mind when she coined that phrase. The way she described it, they had be questioning him, and he would be answering questions in a slack and metering way, as if he hadn't really been paying that much attention during normal boring work days to ideas like this, until suddenly they asked a question about him about why he made some key decisions, and he would light up and remember an incredibly banal phrase that was clearly like a mantra to him. He would repeat exactly the same phrase and exactly the same words that he used in his head 20 years earlier. And the phrase would be so trivial, if you like the bureaucratic equivalent of a sports cliche, that you just couldn't believe that this is what the turning points turned on. But she came to believe that this was what the soul of the man was made of. His motivational center, the place he reached bottom when shoring up a certainty, was a storehouse of platitudes that he was very proud of having created himself. And just like in sports, if these cliches allowed him to focus and work harder and have more faith in himself, the real motivation that made him want to focus was ambition. That's how she saw him. The thoughts were simply mantras to rev him up or slogans to convince others. What he really wanted was to advance within the system. He wanted to solve the problem his superiors gave him in a way that impressed him. He took initiative in foreseeing problems or in modern jargon, he was proactive. But the amazing thing was how these mantras, which fit into this organization, completely cut him off from any considerations that instrumental ones and career ones. Clearly, he was a clown and a buffon, buffon in the courtroom. He was like a child who lived in a video game and is taken back to his bedroom. He was completely out of context in the courtroom. And the only way he could turn back to his old life was via the cliches and the banalities which he put on like he put on a uniform. Now, there's a big debate now if Eichmann was putting, on a sh putting up a show in Jerusalem at the courtroom and he, if he really wasn't himself. And I think this is an irrelevant debate because even if he put up a show, it is exactly that putting up a show which made him what he was. And so these mantras are literally the banalities of evil. And then once she wrote it, that phrase got extended to much of the rest of his reasoning at key turning points, which time and time again were focused on how he would affect his career rather than how it would affect the world. Which in our perspective, placing the two things by, by, side by side, his career and the Holocaust means he focused on the incredibly trivial rather than the enormous, the banalities rather than the enormities. And then Arendt named an essence. And I think if you listen to the lecture of yesterday, you also understand why she, was, why she wanted to name an essence with a poetic ring that seemed like it made perfect sense while hovering just beyond our grasp, the banality of evil. By the time it was over, however, the Eichmann trial paradoxically had, had initiated a massive universalization of Nazi evil best captured by Hannah Arendt's enormously controversial insistence that the trial compelled recognition of the banality of evil. Eichmann could be every man. The trial in its aftermath eventually became framed, and this is the sociological trajectory that I want to take now, framed in a manner that narrowed the once great distance between post-war democratic audiences and even Nazis, connecting them rather than isolating them from one another. This connection between audience and antagonist it intensified the trauma's tragic dramaturgy. But Arendt's point was much more radical. And this is another, I think, sociological trajectory her reading of Eichmann took. It is not the intentions which count, but the outcomes. 
We don't care about motives. Even modern genocide is the outcome of a very sophisticated division of labor where everybody chips in. Motives play a lesser role here. For Arendt, intentions, like anti-Semitism, play a lesser role than the outcome. More generally, Arendt's commentary, I would even call it a midrash, a commentary of a holy text, spoke to a generation for whom World War II would serve as a touchstone of moral experience as such. What Arendt had called the haunting specter of universal cooperation with evil, whether as foot soldier, collaborator, or bystander, found post-war expressions in anxious, anxious texts of self-scrutiny from existentialist manifestos in Paris to these famous Stanley Milgram's shock experiments in New Haven, America. Just listen to the uh, by now iconic Leonard Cohen poem from 1964, All There Is To Know About Adolf Eichmann. Eyes, medium. Hair, medium. Weight, medium. Distinguishing, distinguishing features, none. Numbers of fingers, 10. Numbers of toes, 10. Intelligence, medium. What did you expect? Talents, oversized incisors, Green saliva, madness. Now, Arendt categorically rejected the notion that there's an Eichmann in every one of us, but her insistence that the success or failure of mass murder depended in part on the choices of discrete individuals in discrete situation naturally led readers to ask, what would I have done if I had been in their shoes? Meaning judgment again. But as Arendt wrote in her essay, Personal Responsibility on the Dictatorship, and I quote her, all that matters is the insight that no man, however strong, can ever accomplish anything, good or bad, without the help of others, end of quote. This is the point she made about the modern perpetrator. This is what modern evil looks like. It is a joint and collective effort. This collaborative dimension of mass murder was another reason why Arendt de-emphasized motive. When evil is sufficiently large scale, not everyone involved will share the same intentions. People will act for a variety of reasons. Many of them have nothing to do with the criminal nature of the enterprise itself. This was her judgment. Now, we know more about Eichmann now. We know today that he was a fanatical fighter for his cause. Or as he put it himself, and I quote him from the famous uh, Sassen interview, I must honestly tell you that had we killed 10.3 million Jews, I would be satisfied and would say, good, we have exterminated the enemy. We would have completed the task for our blood and our folk and the freedom of nations had we exterminated the most cunning people of the world. I'm also to blame that the idea of a real total elimination could not be fulfilled. I was an inadequate man put in a position where really I could have and should have done more." End of quote. Clearly, bureaucracy plays a role here. And as she already wrote in 1952, and I quote her again, today no man in an official position can take the slightest action without immediately starting a stream of files, memos, reports, and publicity releases. Hitler's great ambition was to found a millennial empire, and his great fear in case of defeat was lest he and his fellows go unremembered in centuries to come. Red tape was not only simply a necessity forced on the Nazis by the organizational methods of our time, it was also something they enthusiastically welcomed and multiplied, and so they left to history, and for history, and so they left to history, and for history, typewritten records of each and every one of their crimes in at least 10 copies, end of quote. I'm not saying she was wrong about Eichmann. She could have been wrong about Eichmann. She was right about him, I would say, but not right about him. She was right about him generically, but she could have been wrong about the specific person of Adolf Eichmann standing at trial. <coughs> she couldn't know back then, since the research on Eichmann was basically initiated by her. 
He was more responsible than people knew in 61, more in charge, more ideologically inclined to do what he did. But that does not take anything away from her willingness to judge him as she did, as a Jew and a human being. But before the Eichmann book, and before the book on totalitarianism, Eichmann wrote these beautiful, now after the book on totalitarianism and before the Eichmann book, Arendt wrote these beautiful sentences in her book, The Human Condition. They remind us what is at stake when we think of mass death, and even, and I think they also remind us what this workshop is all about. And I quote her again, the task and potential greatness of mortals lie in the ability to produce things, works and deeds and words, which would deserve to be, and at least to a degree, are at home in everlasting bliss, so that through them mortals can find their place where everything is immortal except themselves. By their capacity for the immortal deed, by their ability to leave non-perishable traces behind, man, their individual mortality notwithstanding, attain an immortality of their own and prove themselves to be of a divine nature. To sit in judgment was for her one way of staying alive under the constant presence of mass death. Thank you very much.